Hi, I'm Rick Steves. Every year, my staff and I take thousands of travelers on dozens of different itineraries all over Europe. I've put together a great staff of guides, all of them passionate teachers, wonderful travelers, and as you'll see, they love their work. Now, our tours aren't for everyone. The purpose of this video is to help you decide if our style of travel is right for you. For the next 45 minutes, you'll join us on one of our classic Best of Europe itineraries. The guides, buses, tour members, and experiences you see here are representative of every tour we lead. Travel is great living. If you like what you see, we'd love to have you along. Now, sit back, relax, and enjoy a little taste of the Rick Steves tour experience. Thanks. Welcome to Paris. I'm Ben Cameron. I'm going to be your guide. Usually when we start the tours, we have an introductory meeting where we kind of uh, introduce ourselves, get to our first uh, impression of each other, but also to kind of explain the way the tour is going to work uh, on a practical level once we're over here. And by and large, it's just reinforcing the, the more important things and uh, really just kind of getting on the same page and. Uh, getting excited about the tour together. It's really one of the best public transportation systems anywhere in the world. There's, uh, I think I mentioned last night, 300 stops. From there, usually we go out and uh, get acquainted with our neighborhood and uh, do some sort of walk, get some fresh air, and then uh, sit down for a typical dinner together that first night. It's really when the fun starts, when we really have a chance to start to chat with each other a little bit. This is the way that most of Paris looked for the next several hundred years, after right around the 11 and the 1200s. It retains this character until the 19th century. For most tours, the first full day of the tour, that's when you really start to learn about the place, start to experience the whatever city that you're in. 1242 to 1248, six years it takes to build this. What that means is we're right in the heart of the Middle Ages, what we were just talking about. How are they building it? They're using a state-of-the-art construction technique for that period of time, what we now call Gothic. As soon as we started talking about Paris, it was immediately obvious that he does a t ton of research. He's uh, passionate about what he's talking about. Very tenured, uh, very relaxed, easy to be with, uh, very flexible. There's that quote from Victor Hugo that says, great buildings like mountains are the work of centuries. And this one was 200 years just in the initial construction. You can say as it looks today, you could even say 700 years. They say it was on this job site that the wheelbarrow was invented. Usually we have a pretty full day, that first day, where we can uh, kind of set the stage for everything. And then usually there's also some free time that day where we've given options for what people can do in that free time and uh, go off and make their own discoveries. He was also constantly telling us how to orient ourselves in the city in terms of this is the way the metro works, this is what you need to look for. He was interested in helping us to learn how to do this ourselves later, so that on our free time we were sort of more comfortable in the city and we could find a way around and next time we can do it even better. Ben is excellent. Ben uh, is, is just uh, uh, the epitome of grace under pressure. But you know, I've had five tour guides now and uh, they've all been excellent. They're not cut out of a cookie cutter mold. So Florence builds this magnificent church. Arnolfo di Cambio dies, and there's a big hole in the ceiling. There's no dome. They don't know how to build a dome. There's a, a, a wide, wide range of different backgrounds that we all come from. There's uh, plenty of, of guides that are from Europe. There's plenty of guides that are from the United States or Canada or elsewhere. The, the common denominator, I think, really is that sense of wanting to provide a good experience for travelers, I think, that, uh, that sets them apart. Rick Steve's tour guides, I think they, they are like in a family. Um, we share our knowledge, our experience with each other. The philosophy of the company is different. This is why I like the idea of becoming a tour guide for Rick Steve's, because you really want the people to have the real experience. I think something that's very uh, different is this teaching philosophy. We're trying to teach people to become independent travelers. We want people to come on our tours, but we also want them to learn how to travel on their own and be independent travelers. Because we want them to go out and kind of have their own adventures and have their own experiences. 
my motivation is to make sure people have a good experience and have a good time and, and get out of their travel experience, whatever it is they're looking for. And different people look for different things. Some people want to learn more about the, the history. Some people are more interested in the art. Some people are really interested in the food and wine. Some people just want to meet new people. Whatever it is that people are looking for, I, that's my primary concern is that they find it. It is really a pleasure when you see on the face of your people that they like it, that they discover something, that there is something new in their life. What really I like very much and gives a lot of satisfaction is when I see the people getting back to their roots if they have them here. We say that blood is not mineral water, that it's in yourself. You should never, never deny your roots. It's when I see the, uh, the joy in the two members' eyes, and I have this very precise example here. We go to Mont Saint-Michel, and I remember being there with a, with a group, and after dinner, everybody was out on the ramparts overlooking the tide going up and saying, you know, wow, this is real amazing. When I see an entire group on the ramparts enjoying that, it brings me some great joy. Having a chance to get to meet people that come from different parts of the country or different backgrounds, different age groups, and then to share those experiences together and then to bring everybody's background and personal experiences together. I think that adds an element to traveling that's uh, is really a lot of fun. I get to take people through these kind of quintessential peak moments maybe in their lives. Finally, they get the opportunity to come over to a place that they've been dreaming about for a long time. And so I'm the person that gets to facilitate this amazing experience. I get to see it through their eyes and get to share in that excitement. And I think that's probably the best part of being a guide. There's so much life to the city and it's so busy and there's always something going on and you can always find something to do. Getting to be a Parisian for a few days, uh, knowing where to go thanks to the guidance of the, of the tour guide makes all the difference in the world. You'd be hard pressed to find a city that has more to offer than Paris does. On day one, your guide sets the tone and standards for the entire trip. You'll have a thoughtful balance of structured time with your guides to cover the most important sites and museums, like the Louvre in Paris, combined with plenty of free time to rest and explore on your own. This allows you to get the most out of your time and energy in any one location before moving on to the next stop. In this case, that's the town of Beaune, in the heart of Burgundy. It was just the small village. It was nice to walk around. The people were very friendly. The place where we stayed was just, just wonderful. The, the folks that, that ran the hotel, it just couldn't have been any more warm and inviting. You know, I've stayed in some of the best hotels in the country, in the, in the United States. And uh, you walk in and you say, oh, this is nice. I've stayed in uh, a lot of these hotels on the tour. And when you look back a few years later, I, I can't remember the five-star hotels, which was which, but I remember these hotels because of the charm. The hotels on this tour were great, um, always well-kept, um, fabulous staff, um, always clean. Some were, you know, a little more modern, but then we'd stay in some local ones that had a lot of character. They've been very unique. They haven't been same old thing. You don't feel like you're, you're stuck in an American hotel. You definitely feel like you're in a local hotel and with a very European flavor. They've all been smaller hotels, which I like. It's not the cookie cutter, you know, American hotels transplanted to Europe. They've all felt very, very authentic to the regions and to the areas. One thing is always the same, and that's that they're in some way unique. They're gonna be a little bit different than what people would experience in the U.S. Um, sometimes they're gonna have stairs, sometimes they're gonna have really small elevators. I like that they're not super commercialized. They're really kind of intimate, so the staff is really friendly. They give you a feeling of a private home, which is very, very nice. The employees, they are working in um, the same hotel for many years. It's a bit like a family. 
for the most part, they're always going to be central. We really place an emphasis on that, being well located, close to, to different sites, but also uh, close to public transportation. They are located in the heart of the area that you want to be in. Just like with real estate, location is the most important thing for a hotel, particularly when you're in a town for two days. You need to be where the action is and where you can get to the major sites conveniently and easily. You could tell a lot of thought was put into them because a lot of times we were right near a bus station or a metro station, um, definitely next to a public transportation site, which becomes vital when you're traveling. One of the reasons to, to stay in a city rather than the outskirts or rather than on a cruise ship, for example, is that uh, you know to be able to see the city after dark or early in the morning, to be able to get around easily is essential. So that is, I think, for me, one of the most important things. Having just a, a nice and comfortable place to come back to at the end of the day or during the middle of the day is, uh, is really an essential thing. You need a good place to be able to, to rest up and uh, to feel comfortable at night. And the hotels always provide that. On this itinerary, it's time to shift gears from the French charms of Bonn to the more rustic and invigorating high-altitude fun of the Swiss Alps. On our tours, the smoothest and most efficient way to get from one destination to the next is generally by bus. I actually was more anxious about the bus part than any other part of this tour. I thought, you know, I don't want to be on a bus the whole time. And it was nothing like that. I was very hesitant about the bus. When I saw the amount of bus time on this tour, I was like, eh, that's not going to be good. Um, but, you know, first stepped on that leather-seated, well-lit coach, like, I was thinking this is going to be OK. We get off the bus, and I'm thinking, was that really four hours? Because it felt like an hour and a half. I hate to say this, but you almost look forward to the bus rides because it is so relaxing. The buses, especially in, in, in this part of the world, are fabulous because you know that you travel 20, 30, 40 miles, and the landscape changes. So you have views that you could never enjoy being on a, on a plane. You have views you can never enjoy being on a car because the car is not high enough. On a Rick Steves tour, the buses are really, I think, probably different than other tours because we use a full-size bus, but we only have a maximum of 28 people on it. So there's always plenty of room to move around and uh, feel comfortable. And if you feel like sitting next to somebody, you can. But if you feel like having a seat to yourself, that's, that's usually a, a possibility. And uh, the buses are all comfortable. They're air-conditioned. We've all got plenty of room. We can stretch out in, in two seats ourselves. The bus is big enough that we all have our own little aisle to sit in if we want to. You can stretch out. You can ask questions, have long conversations with people around you, and get to know them. You can go to sleep, you can watch the sights, you can read, you can chat with those around you. We've shared food up and down the aisles. Somebody will pick up chocolate at one stop and it goes up and down the bus. I really liked uh, having that free time to either catch up on sleep or study up on the next place we were going. We've all taken some pretty good naps, I think, along the way. And the trips are really uh, well coordinated with uh, frequent rest stops. And, uh, you know, nothing's felt like it was an all-day trip. Usually we try to stop fairly frequently. We try to stop every two hours or so, either find a little town to stop in or, or just use a regular rest stop along the way. And that gave us plenty of time to get a snack if we wanted to. Some people even used it as an opportunity to buy uh, little souvenirs. And coffee. And coffee. <laughs> They broke it up beautifully. I mean, there was no big stretches, and all us women had time to go to the bathroom when you too. <laughs> Bitter. Bitter. Wow. Before you get to a destination, you already know what to expect. You've already got a lesson in the language of the town or culture or country, wherever you're pulling into. I like to give a mix of, of quiet time and, and also take advantage of the fact that we're together. We have a microphone and uh, to talk about what's coming up next. Almost every day, Ben comes in uh, on the bus for us and talks about what's going to happen that day, where we're going to go, where stops will be. He usually goes through the history or background of where the location is we're headed for. So it's always really interesting to get that information up front. There's a hike that you can do from Kleinescheide called the North Face Trail that walks directly under the North Face of the Eiger. He always gives us tips about places to go and things we might want to think about doing and, and, and places we might want to eat where we might get the most authentic food. Then the great thing too is it's easy to answer questions, to go around, to move, uh, to move through the bus and to see if anybody has more specific personal questions that they need answered. It's been informative, it's been fun, and it hasn't really been intrusive.
We know the drivers, they know us, and uh, we, we have a good working relationship with them. Our driver, oh my gosh, he's been great fun, Joe. He's wonderful. Our bus driver, Joe, was such a charming man. A lot of fun, you know, he's an amazing driver. Got us through some tight squeezes in Italy and some really steep Alps in Switzerland, so he knows his stuff, and um, he was a great addition to our tour. He is always fun to work with. He's professional, he knows the route. And he's always full of suggestions, different options. And for example, uh, we had a situation on this tour where uh, a detour came up, they were doing some road work, and he suggested that we take the scenic route. And uh, I think that for a lot of people going up and over the Swiss Alps, and just seeing the side of Switzerland that we, in a normal situation, would have completely missed, I think was a highlight for a lot of people. It's amazing how he can get this coach through these little narrow passes. And Katie is terrified of like heights and being on the mountains. And uh, so, you know, she was watching as he took these sharp turns up in the Alps, but... Uh, I wasn't watching. <laughs> <laughs> he led us up on this pass that took us past the tree line in the Alps. And it was amazing, and it added so much to the trip. We got out, we got to see something we wouldn't have regularly seen. And that's the nice thing, is that we're flexible. Having our own buses allow us that flexibility, and having drivers that are willing to go above and beyond what's expected from them is uh, a huge advantage for us. Switzerland was remarkable. It, the pictures don't capture it. It's, uh, it's like Disneyland for grown-ups. We had a day in Switzerland where they were completely on their own to do what they wanted. They had lots of different options, lots of different possibilities, and we had a great time. We had a beautiful day up in the Alps. It was great. From the moment we got off the uh, cable car up on the ridge and started walking down through the, uh, the trails they have there, which are wonderful, uh, it was just, the whole thing was magical. It was a great uh, hike across the ridge and then down through the valley all the way back. We stopped and went to the waterfall inside the mountain. Uh, that was great. It was like the perfect day in the Swiss Alps. I think the balance we have on the tour between what we have to do with the group and what we have for free time has been really good. It's one of the main reasons we picked the tour. Was we knew we liked to wander and we liked to kind of do our own thing. We spend a lot of time together. We usually see the, whatever the, quote unquote, most important sites in town might be. Uh, get a chance to get a little bit of the background of the history. Uh, but then we also have a lot of time where people can go off and make their own discoveries. Quite often I find that people's best memories or, or some of their, their most interesting memories are those discoveries that they go out and they make on their own. There's a Jewish proverb which, uh, which is, you can only bring two things to a child, roots and wings. And as a guide, I'm trying to, to bring wings to tour members so they can really enjoy themselves on their free time. Everybody comes to Europe or on a tour with their own objectives, their own kind of idea of the things that they want to do. And so it's really important for us to provide them with that free time so that they can make the tour as individual as they want to. I found that that balance was perfect because um, there's definitely things you want to see and the, the structured part of the tour is to address all those key things, I think. And then, you know, if you've got specific interests, you can cover those in the free time. First of all, any of the structured activities, you do have the option to not participate in. If you really aren't interested in something, you can opt out of that. The structured time shows us the area, gives us a feel for the area. Uh, the guide has been, Ben has been really good about pointing us and telling us, you know, in relation to where we are, where other things are, and, and hitting the high spot. He would give us options every day. Here's some, the top options, and if we weren't interested in those, we could talk to him separately, and he would give us additional ones that might be of interest to us. It was like having a friend in each city, somebody that knew the city and knew your interests and was willing to help you figure out what you wanted to do. And when you went to the big sites, they'd take you there and show you all the good stuff and then send you off on your own. Have some fun. Some people like to be ambitious and go out and see whatever museums are in town that we haven't seen already together as a group. Uh, sometimes there's churches that are little gems that uh, you can just sneak into for a few minutes. Some people like to just go sit in a park or go and just walk around, go sit in a cafe. You can go off and wander and get lost in Venice or go to a beer hall in Munich. Or you can sit on a piazza in Italy and watch, watch the Italians go. I think a lot of people come to Europe for the art and for the history, and that's what the structure time allows for. But I think a lot of people fall in love with Europe for just the culture and the people, and that's what you get in the unstructured time. Munich is another great city. We had um, a great 
tour of the city and really got a feel for the history, of which there's so much. Another great experience to be enjoying in Munich is obviously the beer halls. It's just an environment that's, there's no place like it anywhere. I think that was probably the, the best thing to me about Munich and Bavaria. I enjoyed the food, I enjoyed the beer, I enjoyed the kind of camaraderie of, of the city. The food on this tour is fantastic, so you certainly need to pack your, your fat clothes. I was looking forward to the food on this trip, and I wasn't disappointed. I never had an empty stomach by any means. I'd say the one complaint that we might get is that we have too much food. You know, love goes through the stomach here. So uh, we hope that everybody falls in love with our country. So we hope to give good food. Eating out when you travel alone can be kind of stressful. And on this trip, that's never the case. Every meal has been exactly what I wanted. For me, the best thing is I don't have to figure out where I'm going to eat every night. You know, I, I just want something that's going to be good. On our tours, we always provide breakfast every day. Breakfast is usually served at the hotel. Usually people are free for lunches, and uh, we'll give suggestions for that. And for dinners, we have half of our dinners included. And the breakfasts in the hotels are, are really different from place to place. And in a lot of places, like in Italy, for example, the, the local custom or local tradition would be to have a relatively small breakfast. So a typical breakfast might be a, a cappuccino and a, a croissant, for example. The hotel, they usually have that, but then they've also expanded it out and uh, have a variety of different cereals and, and cold cuts and, and so on. But from place to place, it's totally different. When we were up in Munich, we had uh, vice first what we would consider bratwurst was on the breakfast table and uh, complete with sweet mustard. Delicious, but I think a lot of people were a little bit surprised by that. For all your lunches and half your dinners, you'll enjoy the freedom to choose your own restaurant. Ben has been really great about pointing us to restaurants um, and different places and telling us about some of the local specialties that we should try, and he's been right on the mark every time. If you have a meal on your own, there's the book or your guide to point you in the right direction so you can end up eating with the locals and family-run restaurants and small places off the main drags. The other half of your dinners will be group meals organized by your food-loving guide. The restaurants we've been to have literally been some of the best meals I've had in my life. The group dinners are actually the best because in many towns or countries, maybe you can't decode the menu or you don't know where to go, what to order. You usually have a few choices that's narrowed down, but you get multiple courses. They're usually family-run, local, authentic restaurants. We go where the locals go. We don't go to the big tourist-oriented uh, restaurants. We pick as guides restaurants that we hear about from other locals. It's the real food. The food we get on the Rick Steves tours is the real food. We don't have the uh, experience of eating Americanized food, food that they think we want. Haven't seen a ketchup bottle in a couple of days, but I'm sure they'd bring one if I asked for it. No many, we always try to give uh, some uh, choice, and we always have uh, uh, some side options for those who are vegetarians, you know, or have some dietary restrictions. We know what uh, regional specialties are unique to each place, and, and certainly we try to take advantage of that. I always like to order things for the group dinners that people wouldn't necessarily order on their own, and that's one of the great things I think about travel. That is just having a chance to try all the local goodies, all the local specialties. We are headed finally for Italy. We're going to Venice and then Florence and then Rome. Probably in Venice you'll use this one a lot. Where is? Where is? Dove. Dove. Venice is one place where you'll have a bit of a trek to get from your bus to the hotel. In stops like this, you'll be glad you packed light and are mobile. Hey, Sarah, do you wish you'd packed lighter? Um, yes. I do wish I had packed lighter. This is a bad decision. And I blame it on laziness. <laughs> if you're on a Rick Steves tour, the way to pack is to pack with a basic carry-on and a backpack. Don't do a big old uh, suitcase. Do not do a big old suitcase. <laughs> have only what you really, really need. What I find out is very often we have 50% more than what we really, really need. One of the things that's included with the information that people receive is a packing list. And, uh, you know, it's different from person to person. Everybody has to find their own balance. But the, the key thing is you have to pack light. Because traveling light, being able to move around easily, really makes life easier. And, you know, sometimes when we park the coach, we have a bit of a walk to get to the bus. Or sometimes we have to take public transportation from the coach into town, for example, in Venice. 
we have to park the coach. We move from there to the boat. We're on the boat for a bit. And then we move from the boat to the hotel. Quite often the hotels are deep in the center of town, which is fantastic because you can be anywhere in town relatively quickly, especially early in the morning or late in the evening when Venice empties out. And Venice is really at its best, I think, early or late. But the other side of that is, yeah, to get there you have to walk a little bit. And people have, have overpacked. It's, it really is a bit of a challenge. Uh, either using a wheeled bag or a backpack, I think the essential thing is to keep it down to the minimum. I'm lost. It's easy to see why Venice has been called La Serenissima, the most serene. But it's not long before the daytime crowds and density of the place make you grateful for our smaller groups. This is still the Greek community of Venice. And the smaller the groups on the Rick Steves tours make the difference. You cannot take care of 50 people if you really want to satisfy and to meet the needs of all the tour members. It is very important to have a small group. Very important, especially on the streets and even in museums. We still have um, a relation to uh, every person. We know who we are. We, we get to know each other's names. We get to know about each other. You wouldn't have the opportunity as a guide to uh, give as much individualized attention to a larger group. We have the opportunity when we're on a bus to spread out. Everybody has their own seat. That relatively small group size, we can go into restaurants where locals eat. We don't necessarily have to go to the factories that uh, might have good food, but it's just not going to be the same atmosphere that you might encounter getting to know a, a, a local restaurateur. It allows us also to stay in uh, uh, smaller hotels because, you know, large groups would end up in chain hotels uh, which are located uh, very often uh, on the outskirts of each town. Also, just moving around museums, you see sometimes larger groups that just really seem to struggle to move from point A to point B. We also can maybe get into different types of museums or the different kinds of maybe hands-on activities uh, or walking tours that we do we just really wouldn't work with a larger group. Taking public transportation is a great example too. We take buses, we take the metro, we take whatever the locals do to get around quite often uh, once we're in a city. And it's just impossible if you had a bigger group. People that may not be familiar with it, it gives them an opportunity to, to learn how to use it as a group. And so when they have their free time or when they come back on their own individually, they'll be more comfortable. So I think the small groups are an absolute uh, cornerstone and, and uh, we wouldn't be able to be as effective with a larger group. With our small groups and guides eager to maximize your experience, we'll be out late in places like Venice, which take on a completely different character when the crowds depart and the sun goes down. You can go on an evening pub crawl, enjoy the music on Piazza San Marco, and maybe cap your evening with a romantic gondola ride. In Florence, the home of Michelangelo and Botticelli, all our groups take a Renaissance walk through the city center, as well as a tour of the Uffizi and Accademia galleries. You'll appreciate the passion and expertise of your guide when it comes to understanding the art and history in a place like Florence. I love teaching people the art and history of Europe. I love to teach history and, and art. And I think all of us are willing to, uh, uh, to teach in a kind of relaxed way. This tour has done an excellent job explaining the art and the history and the architecture of all the places we've been to. It can be daunting when traveling in Europe because it's everywhere. And if you don't know what to look for, you feel like you're missing out the whole time. Obviously, if you come to Europe, you're going to see quite a bit of art. Whether you appreciate art or you don't coming over here, you will certainly walk away with a great appreciation for the European art when you leave. I think the guides did a great job of making the art accessible to people. They were able to put it in perspective and also show the interesting parts about 
the important paintings. This was lost completely during the barbarian invasions, and it wasn't uncovered until 1506 when a farmer dug it up in his fields. And his it was not just dry, this is this, and this is the, uh, the movement in this, and, and so forth. It was, it came to life. On most tours, we're gonna spend some time in museums or going into churches and, and just having a chance to see wonderful works of art in situ. And when we're here in front of the actual um, sculpture, the painting, it's a good opportunity to certainly deal with the numbers and the raw facts, but also to try to draw some connections between them from country to country, from, from uh, era to era, and try to give the tools that people can take with them wherever they go. I think this was my at least third time to the Louvre, and this was by far the most significant experience. This time we had a local guide that took us through to various pieces and pointed out what we were looking for, what period it came from, why it's significant, why we would even want to study this. You get really just the best of everything without having to spend a whole day there and not knowing what you're taking in. So it's been awesome because you really know you're appreciating the best of what there is. They're in the church. It's during the moment of transubstantiation when the host and the wine turn into the blood and the body of Christ and the killers take out their daggers and start to stab away. Giuliano falls immediately to the floor. Lorenzo's friends were able to crowd around him and keep him safe. I think the tours really do make history accessible. In the U.S., I don't think we get a very good perspective of history at all. And when you come to Europe, first of all, you get to see it firsthand, which is great. Uh, Europe uh, uh, and France, and in my case, is, is old. It's, uh, it's over 2,000 years of history, and you cannot uh, explain anything that we see outside without having to go through history. Yeah, when we go down to Rome, where we stay, we're actually staying across the street from the largest of the Roman bath complexes that could have accommodated 3,000 people. They really bring out the links between things. So, you know, we started out in Paris, and Ben was already talking about, you know, when we get to Rome, you're going to see how this all ties together. At first, they may seem far removed from our present day, but then to draw the connections between past and present, I think everybody can latch onto that, and everybody can understand that quite clearly. And in those sorts of moments where you do understand that the, the past and the present really do coexist in many cases, I think that is a great way to, to kind of teach the, the history. With the intensity of Florence and of Italy in general, your bus provides a comfortable refuge. And after all that Tuscan sun, a dip in the pool back at the hotel provides a delightful break. While there's plenty of time for rest, our tours are definitely more active than most. There's a lot of go. They're trying to pack as much art, history, culture, food, wine into every experience as possible. You have to be in some type of good physical condition to be on a Rick Steves tour because if you're not in good shape, you're not going to be able to really take in everything and enjoy it as much as you would. The tours are a little bit more uh, active than other tours. We do a lot of walking. There's a lot of steps. You end up standing in museums and uh, that all is something that you have to be prepared for. Especially a city tour. Of course, we walk a lot, and we go from one place to another by public transportation, in metros. There are staircases up and down. There are hotels that don't have elevators, so you're going to be carrying your baggage up and down stairs occasionally. There are towns where the bus has to park a fair distance away, and you may walk on cobblestone. You're going to be maybe doing hiking. There are going to be long days. Rome is an amazing city. You want to see the Colosseum, you're going to be walking up the stairs at the Colosseum. There's no way around it. Well, I think you do have to be able to carry your bag and, and walk uh, several miles during the day for the tours. And if you want to do your own activities, you certainly need to be able to, to be adventuresome and do that. Walking is an issue for you. I don't think it's the right tour for you. But, but I don't think you have to be a mountain climber. I don't think you have to be an athlete. You know, I just think you have to be able to, to, to do some walking and be okay and make sure you have your comfortable shoes. <laughs> you throw fashion out the window and, <laughs> and have the comfortable shoes. There are a number of people on this trip that are in their 60s and 70s that get on just fine as well as anybody else. I think you need to have a certain degree of fitness, but I'm certainly not what I would call a super fit, but you need to be in reasonably good shape. You, you don't want to come over here and be a couch potato and miss out on some things because you're not physically able 
to participate. You need to be physically fit enough to do the tour, but you could also be prepared to skip some activities. If you can't do everything because you have little issues, you can do the, the tour in any case. But just be prepared to not do some activities and that will be perfectly fine. There are some strenuous days. There are some relaxing days too. You know, we had this relaxing time in the Tuscan countryside, which was, you know, there was hardly any exertion that day. I think most of the exertion was with their hand. How's the pool, Bill? The pool is wonderful. <laughs> After a hot day in Florence, it can't be beat. <laughs> Tuscan countryside was just beautiful. I mean, Joe, our bus driver, had to maneuver down this narrow driveway with hairpin turns and worrying about cars coming towards us. And not until we got there do we appreciate how beautiful it was. We got out and went to our rooms and they were little individual cottages separate from the main house. The uh, olive trees and the wine vineyards were just fantastic. Um, just a really picturesque place. And after everybody got there, we all went out by the pool and relaxed. We had fabulous dinners there, very Tuscan dinners where we sat underneath a black walnut tree. Tuscany was kind of like a resort. Um, we had a pool, we had gorgeous weather. The people at our hotel were amazing. So I felt like at that point, I'm like, wow, this, we're on vacation here. It was just wonderful. It was. It was just the perfect respite before we headed to Rome, which we knew was going to be a very busy finish. Very good group, like always. I'm enjoying it. Next week, another one. Bell, Germany, Switzerland, Austria. As the bus pulls into Rome, this tour's final destination, it's time to bid farewell to our bus driver, Joe. Joe. In Rome, that restful break in Tuscany pays off as we hit the ground running on a tour of the major ancient sites with a local guide. She was fabulous. She really brought alive the Colosseum and the Forum and just made you think about not only what the Romans built, but the people that lived there and the life they had, which was very different than ours. I'm with the group for the duration of the tour, but we also bring in a lot of outside voices, local experts that uh, will come and share their, their passion and their, their knowledge of the city that they're from and uh, the city that they, they know best. And uh, we have a chance to be with them for several hours. And, and usually we do that in the major cities where we'll go into museums with the local or just do walking tours throughout the streets. I'll never forget the things I learned and the things I saw in the Louvre because of that local tour guide. I learned more and I saw more and I was in the Louvre for an appropriate amount of time. You could spend the summer in the Louvre. Michelangelo's rival, Bandinelli, did the very muscular pair of Hercules and Cacus. The Florentines snob it and call it the sack of potatoes. And it was the same with all the guides. We had a great guide in Florence and we didn't have to decide where to go or, you know, what's the most important thing to see at this museum. They took us there, they explained it to us. I think one of the best parts of the Venice um, portion of the trip is having that local guide first thing in the morning. Um, it's before any of the crowds get there and you really see the back streets. You see the workers unloading um, into the shops and you get a real feel for how the Venetians live and how the city works. Can you imagine 2,000 years ago, a person who has never seen the photograph of a leopard and then they see the first leopard ever pounce out of the floor live. She just was so passionate and made us feel like, you know, Rome is our city as well. The latest estimates that I've read say that between 270,000 and half a million people died oh. at the Colosseum. Oh my goodness, is the right response. A lot of people on the tour said she brought tears to their eyes and she did evoke this emotional experience. A contrast between how beautiful and intelligent the building is and how infamous and barbaric its use is. I love Rome, but I think just because of the blend of the history and the religion and the art and the new and the old, the food, the people, it kind of, it has everything, it's the whole package. And our groups enjoy a full art and history package at the Vatican Museum. What do you think, does it remind you of anything we've seen? David, isn't it? Isn't it? This is exactly what the Renaissance is a rebirth of. The Belvedere torso, no arms, no legs, no head, but significantly one of Michelangelo's favorites. Raphael comes back into this room and he scrapes off a section of the image and he adds a new figure. He adds another figure and he adds a representation of Michelangelo, the highest tribute. 
followed by a Baroque finale at St. Peter's Basilica. All over Europe, the efficiency of our tours is critical, especially in Rome, where there's so much to see and every minute counts. I've uh, traveled on my own and I've traveled on five of these tours now. And um, I think the efficiency is immeasurably higher on a Rick Steves tour. You can use every single minute if you choose to do so, and uh, there's just no wasted movement. You arrive in Europe and then you depart from Europe, and all the rest of it, your transportation is planned, how you're gonna get around, where you're gonna stay, so that you're not constantly kind of fumbling around for what to do next. First of all, you don't feel lost. That's huge. Second of all, you can just relax, relax and enjoy your day, not plan your day. We're really worried about um, traveling by ourselves, which is why we did this. It was so much easier in a lot of ways that I think we might just want to do another tour instead of traveling by ourselves. Well, it's obvious when you follow a Rick Steves tour that you get more out of it than on your own. I mean, I don't say that people who really prepare their tours can't do a nice uh, trip, of course, but it is often a matter of time. It just saves an incredible amount of time. I always feel that uh, it would probably take you 50% more time if you were to travel on your own versus traveling as a group, just simply by the transportation options, having that all arranged, uh, having the, the advantage of reservations. We don't have to worry about hotels. You don't have to worry about how are you getting from place to place. You know, that's a lot of work, and we don't have to worry about that. It's all planned. So we're able to focus on the activities and, and really enjoy the time we do have. Having personally done some backpacking and spending a couple weeks in Italy with my parents, uh, using the Rick Steves guidebook, which is extremely helpful, um, but still trying to figure out when the trains are gonna run, where to be at the right time, and then wandering in circles, trying to find something when you don't know, you're not acclimated to some of these cities. You won't have to think of how to go from one point to another. You will not have to think where is the ticket booth and waste your time to find it before uh, you get inside. You don't have to wait in lines. We didn't wait in line at the Louvre. We didn't wait in line at the Academy in Florence. We didn't wait in line at the Uffizi or the um, Vatican City. And the lines are huge at some of those places. So it really saves a tremendous amount of time. You got some of those structured activities which take you to the key things. And then the guide gives you um, some great ideas to, to do on your own. So it's very efficient. I always enjoy, you know, asking people when we have our free time where, you know, what they're interested in and making sure that they're pointed in the right direction and uh, giving them little tricks that I've accumulated over the years. And that's really what I consider one of my main responsibilities to be is to use people's time efficiently. If you've traveled this far and obviously Time wasted is, is time lost. The Rick Steves Tour really combines the efficiency that's necessary to see as much as you need to see in the limited amount of time that, that we all have now with enough free time to enjoy the culture and not feel like you're just rushing from one place to the next. Two weeks time we visited a lot of different countries. Um, there's no way I would have been able to do that as smoothly as we did in the tour. After nearly two weeks together, anyone seeing this group in Rome could easily mistake them for lifelong friends. There's something about our travel philosophy that often creates this sort of esprit de corps in our groups. For me, I can't imagine working anywhere else. I can't imagine working for a different company simply because I love our groups and I love the sorts of people that take our tours. You know, I just enjoy meeting people. I mean, half this trip for me is about the people, both the ones on the tour and the ones I meet along the way. To me, it's enhanced the experience actually being in a group because two weeks with any one person or any one family, maybe, maybe that's not the best idea. I don't meet new people easily, so I was kind of hesitant. You know, you pile in on the first day and meet everybody, and you're checking everybody out. But I have to say, I was just blown away. Like, we had a fantastic group of people. You meet for the first time with strangers, and by the end of the tours, you've, you've gotten to know each other very, very well. And uh, you've shared these experiences. You you've have uh, made a little family of sorts. I've always found that on our tours, every single one of them. There's, there's always been a really positive bond that's been formed. It's amazing to watch it happen. Sometimes I feel like as a guide, what I need to do is just step back and stay out of the way because they do tend to develop good relationships almost immediately. 
After we do our introductions, immediately at that dinner, the volume level of the conversation it sometimes is pretty loud. I was surprised at both of our Rick Steves tours in terms of how the group started out a little tentative, and then after a while it just sort of meshed together. People sort of broke off into little groups, but everyone also had a sense of camaraderie as a whole. They all seem to really uh, bond very well, very quickly, because they, they've all joined the Rick Steves tour for a reason and I think they may be coming with the same kind of travel philosophy. So I think what ends up happening is you have a group of people with a similar philosophy who enjoy the, the, the process and the types of tours that they are. So it's, I think it makes for a very cohesive group. This has been a really fun group to get to know and everybody adds their own perspective to what you're seeing. They were ranged from all these different personalities and ages and experiences, and every time we hung out with different people, we got a different experience. Different people have strengths, different, different people have weaknesses, and I think when you're in a group, you kind of all complement each other, and um, it just makes your experience a lot more enjoyable. You come together as kind of individuals, but you end up meeting people that, you know, could have been long lost friends. We definitely made some friends along the way, um, hope to keep in touch with them, and um, so very, very happy. Sad to leave them all. Big cheers that uh, here we are, 13 days later, and uh, we're almost to the end. As this group takes a final walk through the city, visits centuries-old fountains, has just one more gelato, Jerome. and tries to guarantee they'll return, for more gelato. They finally say their goodbyes. It's obvious that the experience they've shared has forged bonds and friendships, many of which will last a lifetime. While we can't guarantee great travel partners, we find the kinds of people who are attracted to our tours add an extra dimension of fun. I hope you can join us too. Whether you're looking for a one-week great city getaway, a three-week multi-country adventure, or anything in between, we've got an exciting itinerary for you at ricksteves.com. Let's experience Europe together. Sweet voice so, coming through the see. microphone. I'm trying my best, Mary White. <laughs> like being in the doctor. Check your battery, check your mic. You're gonna think we paid you guys. <laughs> you are gonna pay us, aren't you? <laughs> in gelato, right? I bought the hat because I didn't want to look like a silly American anymore. I really wanted to fit in with the native culture, and uh, this is how I do it. Did it come or go? It's kind of been swirling around. Is it, ru it, ru is it ruining my Oscar yeah, moment? <laughs> I'm sorry. This is the two ladies next time. It's like a job interview. No. It is. It's just a little. <laughs> what are your weaknesses? <laughs> so, you got used to just taking turns going to the bathroom or cleaning up in the bathroom and stuff. Okay. Yeah, normally you take turns to go in the back. What is the zip line? The first things I ordered were these little octopus, a little octopi. First thing I ordered were these octopuses. Oh, wait, I think octopi. octopi. <laughs> It's very smooth, so uh, that's why two members fall asleep very quickly because they're too smooth. Uh, I think there should be more bumpy so people could, you know, keep their attention. Ben, can you please explain this to me? <laughs> <laughs> it's been a heck of an eight days, that's all I gotta say. Look like you're enjoying yourself. Yes, please pretend you are having fun on a Rick Steve's tour. Oh, I still look like we're crying. 
Good, that's good frolicking. Something that you'll remember after this trip? Maybe, maybe one thing. We got engaged. Wait a second. What'd you say? We got engaged. You got engaged? Yeah. It's kind of crooked. It's very dark. <laughs> we'll pause for laughter now. Finn's really fun. I heard that he was 34 or mid 30s. And I was thinking, awesome. This is probably going to be like some dad maybe like dad figure like kind of like gray hair no offense you know what i mean like just really boring person and he's made it a lot of fun you're a lot of fun too you're not boring because you're a dad figure are you sick and tired of Aaron and I going around? <laughs> no, I was just telling Aaron, and finally I'm relaxed, and if I could do it again, I would, because it would be a totally different thing. 